Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Penn Humanities Forum. I'm Jim English. I'm a professor in the English Department, director of the Forum. Before introducing uh, our very distinguished speaker uh, for today, I, I do want to call your attention to this uh, next event, uh, a week from today, which will not be here in the, um, uh, in the museum, but Caddy Corner in the Bodeck Lounge of Houston Hall. Uh, so um, that, that will be the final event in our series this year on virtuality. And it will be a, um, a roundtable conversation on puppetry um, involving Robert Smith, the uh, um, puppet theater uh, director, manager, creator um, here in Philadelphia, Marty Robinson of Sesame Street and Spitting Image, um, Eileen Blumenthal, uh, professor of theater and puppetry at um, Rutgers University and theater critic at the Village Voice. And um, we're going to do a, a slideshow, um, media presentation, got clips and actual puppets, and um, a lot of Q&A with the audience. I think it would be a really interesting and lively event talking about the whole history and the future uh, of, uh, of puppetry, its original um, uh, avatars, as they're called. Uh, we're sponsoring that event as part of the Philadelphia International Festival of the Arts, which is ongoing and is a, a vigorous, um, uh, almost overwhelming program of events all over Philadelphia. So you can look at their website if you're interested in that. And, uh, and as I say, that will be the final event in our, in our series. Today, our format will, as usual, allow a couple of minutes after the talk for people who need to, um, uh, to duck out to do so, and then we'll have time for, uh, for questions. Lorraine Daston is the director of the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, a premier institution in what seems to me at least the increasingly vital field of the history of science. As a, as a teacher, I'm not, uh, I'm not big on uh, curricular requirements. I don't like to teach required courses. But given the, uh, the confused disposition of our society regarding the aims of higher education um, and these frantic, often incoherent debates over the value of scientific versus humanistic knowledge, practical versus luxury learning, and, and so forth, um, I think every undergraduate should be required to take a course in the history of science uh, before graduating. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a field that's much needed uh, for the sake of convergency conversation. In fact, come to think of it, maybe the faculty should also be required. <laughs> uh, I'll sign um, All right, enough. Fortunately, I guess, uh, I don't have any power to, to make uh, decide these matters. So it's, idle, it's idle dreaming. Um, Professor Daston studied at Cambridge before taking her PhD from Harvard in the History of Science Department there. She's taught there, as well as at a number of other universities in the US and abroad. Uh, and she currently holds a position, in addition to her directorship of the uh, MPI, she uh, holds a position on the faculty at the uh, in the Committee for Social Thought at the University of Chicago. Her work is bracingly ambitious and is historical as well as its interdisciplinary range, reaching from science across to art, <coughs> politics, religion, philosophy, literature, anthropology, she mentioned to me just now, um, from the 12th century to the 21st. Her first book, Classical Probability and the Enlightenment, about the erratic struggle to, uh, to work out basic principles and applications of probability theory, uh, won the Pfizer Prize from the History of Science Society, a leading prize in the field, uh, an honor that came to her again for her next book, co-written with Catherine Park, Wonders in the Order of Nature, a study of the role of wonder and wonders of all kinds in the history of scientific thought and practice. Over the last decade, Dr. Daston has written, co-written, edited, or co-edited, edited a sequence of important volumes on objectivity and the emergence of the scientific fact, on anthropomorphism, and on the persistent effort to extract moral norms or lessons from nature. Uh, the eminent philosopher Hilary Putnam said of objectivity, the book that uh, Professor Daston published with uh, co-writer uh, Peter Callison uh, two or three years ago, that it is not just a fine book, but that rare thing, a great book, almost shockingly original. I don't know whether Professor Daston intends to shock us today, but I know that she'll bring to our general topic of virtuality and in this case, 
uh, to, uh, to the natural and the virtual, a most distinct and illuminating perspective. This is a talk I've been uh, eagerly awaiting all year. Please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Dest. Thank you very much for that generous introduction, and most especially for your vote of confidence in the history of science. Um, I can remember a time when my colleagues in other disciplines, upon hearing at academic cocktail parties that I was a historian of science, would dart nervous, sidelong glances toward the exit. Um, so it's delightful to hear from a professor in the English department that our stock has risen. Um, and thank all of you for coming. It's a privilege to address this audience at the University of Pennsylvania. And I only wish that um, the teaching schedule at the University of Chicago would allow me the further privilege of hearing the next event um, in this series. I understand from Jim that those of you who have been keeping pace with this series um, have heard a great deal about the digital humanities. Um, brace yourself for a change in pace. I'm going to say nothing about the digital humanities. My quarry in this lecture is not so much the virtual side, but the real side of the opposition, virtual versus real. And in particular, insofar as I'm going to be concerned with virtuality, it's how the virtual can help us penetrate to the really real, the on us on. The hurricane that devastated New Orleans in the summer of 2005, or the floods that inundated Central Europe in 2002, or the earthquake and tsunami, which have wrought havoc in Japan more recently, these are all the sorts of events that liability law and insurance companies call acts of God. That is, these are events which are so rare, so overwhelming, that no human foresight or power could predict or avert them. Although historically, disasters like floods and volcanoes, earthquakes and tempests have been interpreted by the devout and various religions as divine punishment for human malfeasance, the legal term act of God does not point an accusing finger at human culprits. So um, if you may remember, um, Um, here, New Orleans, shortly after the hurricane in August of 2005. And here, um, a famous depiction of one such biblical punishment. Um, <clears throat> Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed with fire for sexual excesses and being inhospitable to strangers. In contrast to that interpretation, of natural disaster as punishment for human crimes, the act of God is in fact exculpatory. To ascribe a disaster to an act of God or the cognate phrases in other European languages like force majeure or verbe de Wald, is to exonerate humans of all responsibility. That's why insurance companies don't pay up if they can make the case that it's an act of God. <laughs> Since Roman times, there's been a legal escape clause for the causes fortuitous or event due to vis maior, before which human prudence and action are allegedly impotent, and therefore not liable for the damages caused. In the past, the prototypical such case of no human responsibility has been the natural disaster. So as the New York Times editorialized <coughs> after the 1980 eruption of the volcano Mount St. Helens in the Pacific Northwest, um, there was some calm consolation to be drawn from the fact that however catastrophic the consequences of the eruption for life and property, at least there was no one to blame. But natural disasters like the 2005 hurricane that destroyed so much of New Orleans are increasingly described not as acts of God, but as instances of nature's revenge. <coughs> and not only 
um, Hurricane Katrina, um, the editor of the British newspaper, um, the Independent, about the fires um, that swept through Southern California in 2007. Um, in contrast to acts of God, in a legal sense, the phrase nature's revenge does point an accusing finger. These so-called natural disasters are in part due to human activities. Um, on August 30th, 2005, New York Times editorial entitled Nature's Revenge expresses this <coughs> idea clearly. The damage caused by a hurricane like Katrina... Have your attention. Can I have your attention? Hmm. Can the Overbrook School please come to the crest? <laughs> your bus is here. Overbrook School please come to the crest. Your bus is here. Thank you. <laughs> That I call the voice of God. <laughs> so, moving right along. Um, the damage caused by a hurricane like Katrina is almost always called a natural disaster. But it's also unnatural in the sense that much of it is self-inflicted. New Orleans is no exception. And while the city has been spared a direct hit from the storm, its politicians and planners must rethink the bad policies that contributed to the city's vulnerability. So, in this case, someone is responsible, perhaps even legally liable, for the damages caused. Recent sociological studies of natural disasters, like the hurricanes that periodically ravage southern Florida, or the heat waves that killed scores of people in North America in 1995, or in Europe in 2003, point out that mighty financial interests encourage reckless building along hurricane paths, and that equally mighty political interests trap the poor and the elderly in the hottest parts of big cities. <coughs> These studies blame policies that promote risk and vulnerability, but they don't go so far as to suggest that the bad policies cause hurricanes or heat waves. Their argument is that the disasters are indeed natural, but would not have been so disastrous in their consequences had not malevolent human motives been at work. There is, however, a second, stronger line of argument that takes the phrase nature's revenge more literally. In the case of the 2002 floods in Central Europe, for example, environmental historians have pointed out that since the 18th century, attempts to rectify the course of major rivers like the Rhine to drain wetlands, to build dams, or to dredge artificial harbors have always had unintended negative consequences, including more and more severe flooding. Um, so this is the, um, the beginning of those attempts in, in Central Europe. So you'll see what the, the Rhine, you see the Rhine looked like at the end of the 18th century. And you can see that it has the typical sinuous meandering course um, of, a, of an old, slow-running river. Um, and there were repeated attempts, basically, to speed up river traffic by making cuts, as you see here. So here's a meander, and here's an artificial engineered cut, which does indeed shorten the distance between point A and point B, but it has the additional consequence that when um, there is heavy rainfall, uh, or the snows are melting from the Alps, um, the river runs very, very fast <coughs> along this straight part and is far more prone to floods. The deforestation of alpine slopes to create new ski runs for tourists has been similarly cited as a cause of more frequent and more damaging um, avalanches like this one, um, most famously and recently in Chamonix. And of course, the strongest and most urgent case for human culpability in natural disasters has been advanced by scientists and activists investigating climate change. In all of these cases, nature's revenge is meant as more than a metaphor, even if the phrase is still tinged with anthropomorphism. By meddling with the delicate balance of topography, organisms, and climate, so the argument runs, human beings have unwittingly unleashed destructive forces beyond human control. In the past 20 years, 
there has been a gradual but ultimately dramatic reversal of the intellectual respectability of the attitudes encapsulated by the phrases act of God and nature's revenge. Not so very long ago, the legal recognition of catastrophes for which no one was responsible, which were regrettable but beyond human reckoning or control, seemed to be a mark of moral and intellectual progress. We had rid ourselves of the yoke of religious portents and chastisements of reading divine wrath into events that were just part of the course of nature. To look for culprits for damage caused by droughts or hurricanes seemed in that frame of mind to be as benighted as hunting witches. But now, enlightened opinion increasingly wonders whether natural disasters are really all that natural. And it poses hard questions about human responsibility. Um, as an editorial of the leading German newspaper, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, put it after the 2002 floods in Central Europe, quoting now, the theologians of the 18th century called natural disasters God's sermon indeed, God's Tatpredigt. In secular terms, such catastrophes are punishment for a culture that hasn't taken its own catastrophe fantasies about climate change seriously enough, end quote. This shift is part of a still more momentous <coughs> transformation of Western attitudes towards nature, no longer conceived of as beneficent mother or cruel stepmother, nature has become something more like a child in our collective imagination, vulnerable and in need of our protection. But a child which is still capable of responding in kind to injuries, nature's temper tantrums become nature's revenge. In this lecture, I'd like to explore the distinctive emotional responses evoked by disturbances of the natural order. There are several kinds of natural order, each with its own distinctive disturbance. The order of specific natures, the order of universal laws, and the order of local natures. I'll explain about each of these three kinds of natural order presently, but I want to say at the outset that my focus in this lecture um, will be on the order of local nature. When this order is disrupted, either in whole or in part, nature's revenge comes into play. The idea of nature's delicate balance nowadays linked to the modern science of ecology is an ancient and widespread one. And the idea of nature's revenge, with or without its religious trappings, is equally ancient and widespread. Breaches of natural order evoke distinctive emotions, which I'm going to call the passions of the unnatural, horror, wonder, and in the case of nature's revenge, terror. I'm going to argue for the specificity and rationality of these passions, which characteristically conflate moral and natural orders. And in conclusion, I'll offer some reflections on the role of art and technology in harnessing the passions of the unnatural in an age when local nature must be reconceived in global terms and human morality reconceived to embrace an ethics of nature. Throughout the lecture, I'll be exploring, as I said at the outset, not so much the virtual as the real, or rather how the virtual can help us penetrate to the really real. Because nature is so rich in orders, the analogy between natural and human orders can take many forms, and many might argue I would be among them too many forms. Over the millennia, the authority of nature has been enlisted in many causes to justify and to condemn slavery, to praise breastfeeding, to blame masturbation, to elevate the aesthetic of the sublime over the beautiful, and to undergird ethics by appeals to instinct or to evolution. Um, it would take many volumes yet to be written um, to describe this long and motley history, and probably just as many volumes to describe the diverse natural orders used to represent and often legitimate these diverse norms. But there are certain 
forms of order that recur over and over again from Greco-Roman antiquity to the present. At least within the Western intellectual tradition, which is, alas, the only one that I'm competent to talk about, there are three in particular that have exerted strong and <coughs> lasting influence on both learned reflections and popular intuitions, specific natures, local natures, and universal natural laws. Um, let me explain what I mean by each of those. Um, specific natures captures what is perhaps the oldest meaning of the Latin word natura and all of its vernacular cognates and of the still older Greek word um, fusis. Um, a specific nature is what makes something what it is. It's ontological identity card, if you will. It's what makes gold gold rather than copper. It's what makes a fish a fish as opposed to a bear um, or a squirrel. Um, are, we still fossilize this or sense of the word nature in everyday usage. We say it's the nature of bees to make honey, it's the nature of water um, to run downhill. Um, as these examples um, suggest, the, sp the specific in specific natures comes from species. Um, biological species aren't the only exemplar of specific natures, but I do think they are the ones which probably inform our intuitions about specific natures most pervasively and um, most richly. This is an image from um, an early 15th century um, French manuscript of the um, epic Homo de la Rose. And the woman that you see here um, at the forge is de nature. And what she's doing is hammering out the species, each type. So you see she's already completed human beings here, and she has um, a bear here, and a stag here, and she's working with some kind of bird here. Historically, specific natures have been described as those that breed true. And those of you who know the Beaumont de la Rose will know that it contains a famous rant on Dame Nature's part called The Complaint of Nature, in which she furiously attacks those who indulge in non-reproductive sexuality. Um, in fact, in, in some languages, like ancient Greek and in medieval French, um, the word futis or nature um, is used as a synonym for the parts of reproduction, for the genitalia. More generally, specific natures refer to traits that are inborn or spontaneous, as opposed to those imposed by art or education. The order of specific natures is typically disrupted by generation gone awry. So monsters that seem to transgress species boundaries, um, or especially in the Christian tradition after St. Augustine, um, forms of sexuality that don't aim at reproduction, um, including homosexuality. So here's a um, Renaissance image of this kind of disruption. This is from the French surgeon, um, Ambroise Paré, the Prodige of 1573. And you can imagine the story that was told about this particular monster um, as a product of deviant um, sexuality. The order of specific nature has been used to support an ideal of authenticity and to fame an equally long lived specter of the unnatural. Um, and it's with us still currently in debates about cross-species chimeras made possible by genetic engineering. This is a fraud, um, but I hope I just heard a sharp intake of breath. I want you to remember that response in a moment. Um, the second of um, the natural orders, which recurs over and over again, persistently and pervasively, is that of universal natural laws. Um, and they define um, an inviolable and uniform order, everywhere and always the same, exhibiting ironclad regularities. Um, if the, the scientific version of specific natures is taxonomy, that which um, orders the species, um, the science which best corresponds to universal natural laws is astronomy. Um, the motions of the heavenly bodies since antiquity, modeling um, what change was change is all about and perfectly regular. Um, in the next room and in the remotest galaxy, the same natural laws hold. Um, the violation of universal natural laws is not a monster, but rather a miracle. 
like this one, for example, this depiction by Nicolas Poussin of the miracle of Moses striking water um, from the rock. Um, note for further reference um, the hand gestures here of exaltation and wonder on the part of those onlookers who have enough self-restraint not to immediately guzzle the water down. The modern prototype for the order of universal natural laws, the law of gravity, set forth in all of its magisterial generality by Isaac Newton in 1687, this is a vision that fired the imagination of Enlightenment philosophers, revolutionaries, and social theorists. Um, and like the order of specific natures, it, it has an echo um, in certain moral orders. Here's one um, which is, again, a part of the Enlightenment. This is. Um, a, uh, an illustration, a frontispiece, um, from a book published um, um, in, during the height of the French Revolution, during the terror, as a matter of fact. It says, uh, Do you want to be happy? Listen to nature. Um, and it shows nature here. She's depicted as um, many-breasted, um, um, according to a tradition, in fact, a Renaissance tradition, um, that, that Diana of Ephesus um, represented nature. Um, and um, what she is showing here, what she is telling us to listen to, is the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Like the orders of specific and local natures, the order of universal laws is still present in today's imagined moral orders, for example, in the campaign for universal human rights. Local natures, the third of these three orders, are in contrast about the power of place. They refer to the characteristic combination of flora and fauna, climate and geology, that give a landscape its physiognomy. The desert oasis, the tropical rainforest, the Mediterranean shore, or alpine peaks. So you don't need, I think, um, the, lead, the captions on these images to immediately classify them um, according to each of our own implicit um, topography of nature. The modern science of ecology studies the way organisms and topography interweave to create distinctive local natures. Um, but long before there was such a science, people registered the order of local natures as the familiarity of home and the strangeness of the exotic. It starts becoming um, a science in the work of um, Alexander von Humboldt um, in the mid-19th century. What you see here is his attempt to map um, global plant um, distribution um, as a function of um, isotherms and um, latitude, degree of, of, of latitude. Um, and it's to Alexander von Humboldt that we owe the evocative term landscape um, physiognomy. Since ancient times, local natures have been regarded as being tightly imbricated with local customs. So for example, when the Greek traveler and historian Herodotus visited Egypt in the fourth century BCE, he described how by the back home standards of Greece, both nature and custom were turned upside down. Um, quoting from Herodotus, not only is the Egyptian climate peculiar to that country, and the Nile different in its behavior from rivers elsewhere. What he means is that instead of running north to south like the rivers in Greece, um, the Nile runs south to north. But the Egyptians themselves and their manners and customs seem to have reversed the ordinary practices of mankind. For instance, women attend market and are employed in trade, while men stay at home and do the weaving, end quote. So local natures exhibit the same kind of regularities that local customs do. So in contrast to universal natural laws, they are neither uniform nor universal, but they are nonetheless predictable within limits. Um, seen globally, local natures make for a kind of patchwork kilt of fields and forests, tropics and tundra. But within each patch of the quilt, inhabitants mostly know what to expect most of the time. This is the order of nature's customs, to which human customs are closely attuned. Local natures are thrown out of joint, not by monsters, not by miracles, but by disequilibria. Upset the delicate balance of the elements, and the whole is threatened with revenge, nature's revenge. Like specific natures, 
The model of local natures also has a long history from Hippocratic medicine to contemporary worries about how genetically modified organisms might upset the balance of local nature and the impact of giant dam projects like Three Gorges in China. In the course of many centuries and many cultures, each of these natural orders has been used to justify and to imagine many different kinds of moral orders. What's distinctive about the three that I've just singled out briefly is that they've been long-lived, they're polyvalent, and they're evocative of powerful emotions when they're violated. The emotions in question are characteristic and they are vehement. Um, they're also quite unusual among the emotions in combining strong feeling, industrial strength feeling, with intellectual judgment. And I'm going to call them the passions of the unnatural. So each of these three natural orders, specific natures, local natures, universal natural laws, defines and opposes a distinctive form of the unnatural. There are the monsters that violate the order of specific natures. There are the imbalances that capsize the order of local natures. There are the miracles that break the order of natural laws. The distinctive emotional responses that correspond to each of these are horror, terror, and wonder, respectively. These are the emotions, of, or better, I think, the passions, in the original sense of the passions being something that we suffer rather than something that we feel. Um, recall that, they, that patient and passion share the same Greek root. Um, these are the passions that register a breach in order. Whether that order is a natural or a moral order is often extremely difficult to ascertain, and that is, in fact, part of the point. Um, so is the horror that's evoked by an apparent cross species hybrid like that um, fraudulent mouse with a human ear that I showed you a moment ago. Um, is it a response to a trespass against a natural boundary between species or to a transgression um, against a moral taboo? Um, is the terror in the face of a flood the magnified fear of extreme danger to life and property? Or is it fear which is deepened by guilt over partial responsibility for a disaster? Is the wonder of miracles or of free will evoked by snapping the chain of causation or by asserting volition, human or divine, in defiance of all constraints? I think even to pose these questions as either or alternatives seems strained. It's characteristic of these passions of the unnatural to blur the distinction between the moral and the natural. These subjective responses to the unnatural, as variously defined by kinds of natural order, suggest that there's a cognitive component to at least some passions. Horror, terror, and wonder are triggered when a major disruption of order, whether moral or natural or both, is registered as such, an act of perception and judgment that presumes some acquaintance with a particular sort of orderliness that has been breached. So you have to know a fair amount um, about local climate and flora and fauna to register that the swallows are late in returning this spring, um, or that if you live in a different patch of the patchwork quilt, that the monsoon rains are very late this year. Wonder, terror, and horror are not the only cognitive passions. Curiosity would be another candidate, but they're among the most powerful. Not only do all three of these passions contain a cognitive component, there are subterranean connections that bind the passions of the unnatural to each other. So although, for example, horror and wonder may seem poles apart as states of subjective experience, they're linked by deep ties, 
um, witnessed the strange tendency of one passion to tip over into another. Um, I'll give both a historical and a contemporary example. I remember when Katie Park and I were working on our book about wonders, um, we were perplexed to come across sermons in which the local priest or minister harangued his congregation um, for wondering at um, a monster shown in a local fair rather than feeling the horror um, in the face of a divine portent. I think that shows how labile, depending on context, um, the emotion can be. The other is a, um, a, a more contemporary one, which is how many of you follow extreme weather on the Weather Channel? Raise your hands. <laughs> you too? Um, yes, so um, that's a situation where um, horror and wonder are in a very delicate equal poise, depending on how close one may be um, to the extreme weather in, in, in question. Um, it's, uh, I think, more obvious to think about how horror and terror um, are related to one another. Um, but the peculiar terror that's evoked by nature's revenge also does, I think, show revealing affinities to wonder. These passions form a triplet. Um, they're united by their interrelationships and a shared tendency to blur moral and natural stimuli. They're the subjective side of the objective perception of a disruption which is so enormous that even nature seems to quake. Um, despite really, I think, quite dramatic differences in emotional texture, wonder, terror, and horror all contain a moment of astonished disbelief. These are the eye-rubbing passions of, I can't believe this is really happening. Um, and this, I think, is captured very well by um, a 17th century drawing. Um, Charles Blum was doing, was attempting in, in this series of sketches to um, provide um, students of the Academy de Beaux Arts with prototypical expressions. Um, and this is um, here on your far left. Um, this is simple wonder. Um, this is astonishment with terror. Um, this is simple astonishment. Um, and this is um, wonder with attention. Note that um, in all cases except uh, wonder with attention, where uh, the processes of inquiry have been engaged, um, that the response is um, open-eyed and open-mouthed. So like the more familiar moral passions, such as anger ignited by injustice or grief undone by loss, um, these three passions of the unnatural um, are sudden intense states that pounce on us unawares. Um, I found very helpful the work of the literary scholar Philip Fisher, who has written on what he calls um, the vehement passions. Um, and he, he writes about the way in which um, the passions are in contrast, as he says, to the rather wan, pastel emotions, feelings, etc. The passions are intense. Um, they, they seize us. Um, uh, we have feelings, the passions have us. Um, and Fisher goes on to say that when you're in a state of a vehement passion, there's no room for divided consciousness. Um, this, when you are truly angry, this is not a moment in which you can feel irony or ambivalence or um, attempt uh, an act of distant self-observation. Um, that, I think, is very true for passions like anger and perhaps outrage, but it's not true of the passions of the unnatural because they contain this moment um, of eye-opened um, incredulity. Um, what is simultaneously happening with all of these passions um, is a kind of double consciousness, which is not the wry half smile of, of irony or the detachment of self-observation, but of simultaneously registering two incompatible states. Um, this can't be happening. This is not really happening. And simultaneously, it is horrifyingly, terrifyingly, wondrously, really happening. Um, that double consciousness is also, I think, distinctive of these three passions of the unnatural. Um, they're also, I think, distinct from the passions that register some breach of the purely moral order. So, for example, indignation or outrage. 
Um, as the rage and outrage signals, um, this is at root a species of anger. Um, when um, someone, and the someone is important here, not the something, but the someone, um, has breached some uh, um, accepted norm of the community. It is possible in certain circumstances to feel a pulse of indignation or outrage at a something, but generally um, outrage and indignation are reserved for persons, that is, persons who are capable of moral responsibility. So, uh, you know, we can imagine a situation where a gardener uh, who's um, vegetable garden has just been ravaged by a deer, feeling a moment of anthropomorphized outrage at the deer. Um, but that is, I think, simply a moment. Um, and it does not go so far as to um, uh, remonstrate with the deer rather than to reinforce her offense um, against the deer. Um, when there has been um, a moment of genuine outrage, there's also likely to be a flood of volubility. Um, it is the aim of indignation and outrage to confront the culprit with the enormity of his or her transgression, and moreover, to browbeat um, the malefactor into admitting, both by words and by bodily posture, guilt and to um, accept reintegration of the community. Um, perhaps the most interesting experiments of these kinds um, have been the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission's first in South Africa, and more recently in some countries um, in Eastern Europe. So the aim is um, first a um, explosion of reproach, indignant reproach, with an ultimate aim at the reintegration of the culprit into the community um, because the norms by an admission of guilt have thereby been reinforced. In contrast, the passions of the unnatural are dumbstruck passions. There is no torrent of words as there is in cases of breaches of the genuinely moral order, the open mouth of um, Le Grand's sketches. <coughs> these natural disorders shade into human culpability does outrage change the passions of the unnatural. So if the monster is believed to be the issue of a sinful union or a hubristic mad scientist, um, if the drought is due to greedy land grabbers, if the decoupling of cause and effect is believed to be divine or demonic intervention, only then can indignation be unleashed. Disruptions of the moral order in these cases are regarded as complicit in disruptions of the natural order. Yet in extreme cases, the distinction between responses is as blurred as that between orders themselves. Horror can be, for example, evoked by human atrocities so enormous that the question of bare humanity, that is, the specific nature of the perpetrator, is put into question. So, it's often the first response to an account of an atrocity that is barely imaginable to ask, what kind of person could have done such a thing with the implication that it's not a person at all, that someone has thereby strayed beyond the bounds of human nature? Heinous crimes which are knowingly committed can provoke outrage so overwhelming that the observers are rendered speechless as if the evil exceeded merely human bounds. And it's perhaps interesting to note that many of the Renaissance Wunderkammel, uh, which specialized in the anomalies of nature, stuffed two-headed cats and the like, um, also sometimes contained um, portraits of notorious criminals in human history, portraits of Nero, for example, who dissected his own mother to see the womb from which he had come, or. Um, portraits of Vlad the Impaler. Um, there's an analogy here between natural and moral monstrosity. There are some languages, and perhaps some of you in this room speak them, um, which describe acts that flaunt entrenched norms not just as wrong, 
but also as inconceivable or unbelievable or even impossible. Um, in German, you can say, when someone has really done something beyond the pale, that's not unmöglich. And of course, it's all too possible. That's the point. Um, but there is, I think, a, a kernel of deeply felt connection in these hyperboles um, that points to a deeply felt connection between violations of natural and moral orders, which between them cover the territory of the possible and the right. I've gone into some detail about these passions of the unnatural because their specificity and their intensity helps to sharpen the outlines of the different kinds of natural order they monitor, as well as to reveal how significant these orders have been for lived human experience. They're so significant that we seem to have specialized and gripping emotional responses to perceived disorders. The very existence of such passions is evidence of sustained and discerning human attention to the orders exemplified in nature, and also the degree to which such natural orders are morally saturated. As we've seen, the passion of terror is evoked by disruptions of local nature for which human beings feel at least in part responsible. That is, it's the guilty fear inspired by nature's revenge. But until very recently, the perceptions of local order and disorder was just that, local. No intimate acquaintance with either New Orleans or Chamonix is needed in order to be shocked by the devastation of a flood or an avalanche in those places. But to understand and to feel the devastation to be the result of a disturbance of a natural balance does require long experience of what is normal and how things used to be before the catastrophe struck. Because human adaptation and culture depends so crucially on careful, long-term observation of local nature, all cultures pay close attention to variations in flora, fauna, climate, waterways, and the ways in which these elements of local environment move together into an intricate web. And that also includes modern city dwellers. Uh, we may no longer watch for the return of the swallows um, or those signs of a cold or mild winter, but we're just as perceptive about minute variations um, in our built environments. For example, um, the difference in temperature on a hot summer's day between a baking sidewalk and the perimeter, the cool perimeter of a fountain, or if you happen to live in Chicago, um, the breaking of a train in really heavy snow. Um, so at the local level, everyone is an ecologist. What happens when the local goes global? The disruptions wrought by climate change will be brutally obvious at the local level. Deserts will spread in Africa. Sea levels will engulf islands and coastal cities everywhere. Polar bears and other species that depend on ice masses near the poles will be decimated. Malaria and other mosquito-borne diseases will penetrate into previous temperate regions. In contrast, however, to the examples of the floods exacerbated by dams or the avalanches worsened by deforestation, the human causes of these local disasters wrought by climate changes will no longer be local or even contemporary with their effects. Chopped down Amazonian rainforests or brown coal German power plants or methane belching New Zealand livestock or gas guzzling American cars may be far, far away from the damage they inflict. The link between human cause and natural effect becomes even harder to discern, much less viscerally to feel, when it's historical. So in some very real sense, the factories of Victoria and Manchester are still at work in the Earth's atmosphere. Researchers may uncover these connections, but the evidence of statistics and computer simulations does not carry the self-evidence of immediate perception. As a result, Disruptions of local nature caused in whole or in part by global climate change baffle ordinary responses, both intellectual and moral. What are the causes? Who's responsible? 
These are questions which are implicitly framed by a local context, and they're usually dealt with by local political and legal institutions. Moreover, the intelligence and the indignation needed to penetrate the causes and to pursue the culprits, if culprits there be, mostly engage at the local level. Most important of all, the ingenuity and will to set the natural disorder to rights are strongest when they're applied to a locality. The frustrations of the December 2009 Copenhagen Conference on Climate Change demonstrate how enormously difficult it is to scale up local intelligence, indignation, and ingenuity to meet a global emergency. The scientists who make the measurements and build the models of the world climate system may infer the global causes of local effects. The activists who monitor the consequences to humans and habitats may see with moral outrage. The inventors and planners may be working night and day to devise solutions. Together, they lavish intelligence, indignation, and ingenuity upon the emergency that confronts us. But none of these efforts, however necessary, however praiseworthy, can galvanize political will and loosen purse strings like the terror triggered by nature's revenge. This metaphor, even if it's soberly understood to be a metaphor, works upon the passions with a force and immediacy that arguments and evidence cannot rival. To give just one concrete example from recent history, after the terrible flooding of the Oder River that swamped towns in Poland, Germany, and the Czech Republic in 1997, um, the initial reaction was predictably national and implicitly, and often explicitly, hostile to neighborly interests. So Poland's proposal um, was to dredge the River Oder and to build higher dikes um, along the Polish stretches of the river, which would protect the Polish lands at the cost of sending faster Russian waters to dredge their German neighbors downstream. Um, you can imagine what the German reaction was to this proposal. Um, and the fact that the German engineers had in previous um, centuries, decades, deployed similar tactics at the expense of their Polish neighbors did not make the negotiating situation any easier. Um, eventually, with the intervention of the European Union, um, an agreement was reached that would allow the upper and middle reaches of the Oder to be reconquered by the river. So instead of building higher dikes, what they do is to um, move back um, the existing dikes. This was astronomically expensive, um, and it was politically delicate given the historical tensions amongst the countries involved. But nonetheless, this measure carried the day. The terror of the flood that had overwhelmed um, the towns also overwhelmed um, opposition um, in the countries involved. What one of the towns looked like during that flood. The precondition for terror as opposed to simple fear, however intense, is the recognition of responsibility for a cataclysm that dwarfs human measures. Terror registers, amongst other things, disruptions of delicate natural balances with ripple effects that can assume tidal wave proportions. As we've seen, these finely honed perceptions of ecological equilibria and disequilibria are calibrated to local environments. Historically, human beings have lived out their life in one patch of that vast patchwork quilt of landscapes, biospheres, and climates that blinded the planet. Cultures might even be defined as the exquisite adaptation of local customs to local nature, which is why cultures are so luxuriantly diverse, because local natures are. So dwellers in the Alps um, are far better attuned to the myriad conditions that make avalanches more or less likely. Um, the temperature, the texture of the weight of the snow, the tilt of the mountain slope, um, the density of the tree cover, the bustle of the ski activity. So they're primed to recognize um, anomalies and to sort out the causes, or in some cases to assign praise and blame. And under these circumstances, the perceptions and passions condensed in the phrase nature's revenge can function, and most importantly, as in the Polish and German and Czech case, 
they can spur action, even difficult political action, to prevent recurrences. Where reason falters, the passions can sometimes prevail. And as we've also seen, um, these perceptions and above all passions are short-circuited when the local goes global, most dramatically in the case of global climate change. The effects are local, but the causes are remote, both in time and space. And they're so complicatedly intertwined that even the most superlative supercomputer um, can produce no more than a crude approximation of their interaction. In the case of global climate change, scientific evidence may persuade, and arguments from moral fellow feeling with victims and simple self-interest may sway. But neither scientific evidence nor moral suasion apparently galvanizes with a single-minded vehemence of the passions of the unnatural. Perceptions cannot discern balance and imbalance at a planetary level. Passions cannot respond. This isn't the first time that human cultures have been confronted with invisible, impalpable realities which are more powerful, more urgent, more real than the everyday reality conveyed by our senses. Um, it's been a quest of philosophers, theologians, poets, and scientists. Mostly it's been a quest of artists, the masters of representation. How to render the really real to our sensorium and imagination? Because that's the only way that the passions can be engaged. Artists are constantly reinventing realism because the really real is constantly being reconceived. Um, I just refresh your memory for what you all know very well already, which is, you know, how um, the realism of allegory can make abstractions but realities, like truth and time, um, concrete. In contrast, the realism of 19th century French painters like Millet or Jodier um, reveals the reality of a hidden world of the poor. Um, realism should not be confused with naturalism, that is, the mere mimesis of appearances. Um, uh, fantastical scenes like this one of the birth of the Greek goddess Aphrodite from Seafoam can be depicted with breathtaking naturalism without any pretense of realism whatsoever. Only in very specific and circumscribed historical circumstances um, do realism and naturalism coincide, as they briefly do in the 17th century, which is an age in which both science and art um, are um, concentrating on empirical particulars. More typically, artists refresh rather than repeat our experience. Um, sometimes they do take inspiration from scientific visions, new scientific visions of the really real. So there are the pointillists of the late 19th century who are inspired by sensory physiology, or the cubus, um, inspired by the mathematical fourth dimension. Um, sometimes the realities they probe are psychological or philosophical or, or even mystical. Realism in art is as restless as realism in science, though one works in the media of the senses and the other in the media of the mind. This drive to represent is no doubt a peculiarity of our species. Perhaps other kinds of intelligences, Martians or angels, um, beings with no bodies at all, would not need to figure anything. Um, for Martians and angels, orders might just be requiring no representation. But for our species, with our sensorium, the real has to be grasped and imagined, both literally and figuratively. We are outfitted with senses that convey the surfaces of things. So even when um, intellectual curiosity and technological ingenuity allows us to penetrate where our senses cannot go via instruments like the telescope, the microscope, the bubble chamber, um, the radio telescope, um, MFRIs, um, any number of other um, remarkable um, technological instrument. Even then, our urge is to represent what we see. Um, it's, I think, interesting that although most now of the information that's generated by these sophisticated, remarkable instruments is digital, the first impulse is to convert that digital information um, into an image of sorts. Uh, and I deliberately read this particular image pixelated to remind us that it is a um, rather arbitrary visual reworking of digital information, in this case from um, a radio telescope. Um, for, for, for creatures like us, 
If we were, by some miracle, presented with the noumena, things in themselves, we would only be able to understand this phenomena. Um, the parable, Plato's parable of the cave, makes this, in spite of Plato himself, um, screamingly obvious. Um, you'll recall in the parable of the cave, um, at first, um, the people are chained in the cave, um, facing the wall of the cave, so that all they can do is see the shadows, which Plato likens to the mere appearances, the phenomena, literally the phenomena in Greek, the appearances. Um, if, by some wonder, someone manages to escape these fetters and to stumble out into the sunlight to see the noumena, the real things, what he or she is seeing are once again surfaces of things. For beings like us, with our sensorium, um, its appearances all the way down. We live in a new reality that we cannot yet represent to ourselves. The scientific models and graphs and simulations of climate change, and the photos and films about how its effects are already being felt all over the planet, have awakened and alarmed us, but they haven't yet reconfigured our experience. We're still prisoners of the local in our perceptions and our passions. We need an art that can remake our experience, that can weld together the global and the local, and draw together remote and proximate causes into something like a physiognomy to recalibrate our intuitions of order and disorder. Only if we can grasp the new and menacing reality as a representation that can be taken in all at once in a flash of perception can the passions of the unnatural be engaged, and in this case, in the cause of reason. Thank you very much.